A sending is, of course, a horrible little thing, which may have no life at all within it, fitting as it is sent to end all life it grasps. Born from some black magic in the horrible frozen northlands, where the rock and pine compete for place on the high crags, the sending reflects its cold place of origin by appearing as a white mist, but not as the gentle mist of a spring morning, which calls to mind pleasant puddles on muddy paths leading lazily to garden gates and a fine cup of tea or milk within a warm home, but rather a cold, nearly killingly cold, chill as to be found on mountains where no man walks, mountains so haughtily high and lonely that they seem to serve as thrones for unseen demon kings looking down on all their claimed domains. True to its devilish constitution, the mist itself may form into all manner of things, fair and foul, small or tall, to so advance its one aim, to kill the person or thing after which it has been sent. Woe to the man who believes himself capable of overcoming the sending, and of frustrating its aim. There have never been, in all the histories of the world, one such instance recorded. But there have been, in the many tales and legends passed down to us through the grainy gray years of antiquity, stores of stories showing those slain in the attempt. A man might turn to his friend and shake his hand and depart, knowing that ascending has been sent, and that there is nothing man nor beast can do to deflect or defer it. A sending is much as a familiar is to a witch, save that the sending has but one purpose, and upon meeting this purpose itself dies. So in dealing death it meets with its own, if it ever had life to begin. But this story does not directly follow the one particular sending that left the icy crag of Baffin Slurge near the savage sound, but of a young lady some many leagues away who had no idea of sendings or witches or demon kings or dragons, save for what she had read in books. Quida, or as her friends, if she had had any friends, might have called her Quid, was a tall, lanky, bookish girl of about fourteen, and her head rushed with all the romantic nonsense of which someone that age might dream, before they learnt good sense and unhappiness. She sat with her back to a great post oak, centered in and towering above the little field fringed with a mixture of pine, hedge, and briar. Being the smallest patch of farmland of the great estate at which she reposed, it was one rarely worked, and so she liked to come here and read in the shade of the sentinel tree's strong spanning branches, which was so pleasant in the scorching summer sun that she would, should the book not grip her by word or idea, fall fast asleep. It was one such day, when dreams beckoned more than bookplate drawings, and the inward imagination said it could create a better story than anything this author had hitherto related, that it happened. Like the start of most great adventures, it was altogether unexpected, and not recognized at first when it did happen. For Quid sat with her back to the great old tree, and the big black carpenter ants climbed ticklishly over her unshoed toes, for she had taken her shoes off as they pinched her. But before the black ants had climbed any further and awoken her, a great rush of wind whished about her, blowing her hair into her face and the book from her lap, and the poor little carpenter ants clean off her person, and then silent. Quid struck out her arms into the earth to brace herself, though the big tree was more than enough brace, and she had, in fact, not been moved by the unknown blast. Bewildered, she looked around, thinking that perhaps someone had played a prank upon her, bringing out some smith's bellow to blow her about as she slept. But no person stood in sight, and she rolled around the trunk of the tree and saw no person from tree to the very edge of the field. She scratched her head, with slightly shaking hands, noting that her book had been blown some few feet from her lap, and was now the object of inspection for the carpenter ants, who could neither read nor write, but yet took some interest in the thing, possibly because it was made of paper, which was itself made from trees, and these are the carpenter ants' favorite things. What a hoot! came a voice from behind her. Quid turned, and turned round and then round again, not seeing any speaker. But the voice came again, and this time she heard it above her as well as behind, and looked up into the branches of the tree. There sat, with his robed legs dangling from the branches, 
a thin old man with a puffy white beard. His hat was like that some of the farmers wore, yet much taller, and seemed to make him, even sitting as he was, seem all the taller. If you had spun around one more time, I was certain you'd turn into a top, he said good-humoredly, though not with a smile. I beg your pardon, Quit asked in surprise, and strode over to her fallen book to collect it, in case a hasty retreat from the strange man was needed. Are you the cause of that terrible blast of air? She picked up her book and tucked it under her arm, and just remembered that she'd taken off her shoes as well. The old wizard slid and scrambled down from the gangling limbs of the tree, which his limbs, especially spread out in motion, so resembled. He was exceptionally tall and old, and his silver beard had not a hint of black that Quid could see. He seemed in better shape than his appearance would suggest, and she kept her eyes upon him, ready to dash off into the cotton fields should the strange man prove dangerous. But he merely dusted some bark dirt from his robes and ran his hand through the silver strands of his big bushy beard. That was a wishy wind, the old wizard, readjusting his tattered butternut brown beehive hat, corrected. Yes, it wished and whooshed and nearly blew me over. Gangly little goblin that you are, that is no surprise, the wizard pointed at her with his bony finger. But it is not a wishing, as in whooshing wind, which I describe, but a wishing, as in desiring wind. A desiring wind, said the girl quizzically. Is that much like the fair summer breeze, or the wind for which sailors might pray? My dear little girl, the wizard began, and though Quid thought herself much more a woman than a girl, she did not say anything in deference to the wizard's great age, for she supposed that to him anyone under sixty would probably be a dear little girl. That wind was not a summer breeze, and sailors would be blown to rocks and reefs upon the wind you just witnessed. That was my little bit of magic, he prided himself, straightening somewhat and taking on a solemn air. And a fine bit of magic it was. Could have waylaid a troll. Quid looked back at the mass of oak. Post oaks, because of their many spanning branches, would certainly have caught such a wind, though this tree hadn't lost a branch or so much as a single leaf so far as Quid could tell, and she commented that the wizard was saying. The direction was rather more towards the ground, he spoke a little softer, as if a tender ego was in care. And besides, I didn't want to hurt him, now did I? The tree. She wondered whether old magical men spoke to trees, and if they ever responded. Oh, no. Now I would certainly never wish to hurt so noble a being either. My companion, that is. Quid just now considered that the strange old man who stood before her may not be a strange old man by himself. It wouldn't make sense for an old man to go wandering in the blazing sun without an attendant or caretaker after all. But she looked around and saw no one, and looked again into the tree where the wizard had first sat, and again saw no one. Oh, he's not there, is he? The wizard looked up into the branches with her, and she regarded him queerly out of the corner of her eye. He must have landed in the field. Now cotton then was not then as it is now, as it has been bred to have little green and much white. There, as in past days, the cotton stood some three or four feet tall, so that if a person crouched between the rows, they might be hid from one looking out over a field of some maturity. So the tall wizard turned to the field which reached about the tree on all sides and began poking about the plants. Quid couldn't help but follow, curious as she was for the identity of the companion, who had come to the cotton field in such a curious manner. Her curiosity soon satiated, for after a short while the wizard let out a, Oh-ho! There you are, my foul-weathered friend! and pushed aside a few cotton croppings. Quid followed and found the object of his attention. There, in a patch of green and white, lay a small, sleeping dragon. 